Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Deepan. I'm from uh, Department of Surgical Gastroenterology from KGM Lucknow. Uh, I'm going to present a case. Uh, present the case for today. Uh, uh, my uh, patient is a 44-year-old gentleman. Uh, he is uh, coming from Udham Singh Nagar from Uttarakhand. He presented with three complaints of dysphagia for four years and uh, regurgitation for one year, sir. And uh, history of presenting illness. The patient was apparently asymptomatic four years back when he had insidious onset of dysphagia uh, to solids which was intermittent for which he occasionally had to take extra water to swallow food. He had dysphagia to liquids also uh, occasionally for the past uh, one year only. Uh, no history of pain on uh, swallowing. Uh, dysphagia occurred a few seconds after swallowing and was not associated with the immediate choking or coughing or any nasal regurgitation. Regurgitation of food into the mouth for the last one year, uh, more on lying down, which was often indigested foods and false smelling. He also complains of unintentional, uh, unintended weight loss for around 20 kgs in the past uh, four years. Uh, he has no loss of appetite and uh, no history of retrosternal pain or uh, burning sensation. Uh, no history of long-standing dyspepsia, reflex or a prolonged use of uh, uh, PPA or antacids. No history of hematemesis uh, melina. No history of recurrent cough, uh, dyspnea, fever or uh, hoarseness of voice, sir. And uh, coming to the past history, uh, uh, no history of past surgery, he is not having any uh, comorbidities such as diabetes, hypertension or uh, pulmonary cox, no history of any corrosive injection in the past. Uh, treatment history, uh, for the same complaints, he got consultation at uh, SDBJ Lagno one year back and uh, underwent endoscopy uh, underwent an endoscopy and was advised surgery after that but he did not undergo surgery or any therapeutic procedure during the same uh, because of personal reasons sir uh, personal history is, uh, personal history he is not a smoker uh, non alcoholic uh, he is having normal bowel and bladder habits uh, but is not significant and uh, to summarize uh, 44-year-old male with no comorbidities presented with intermittent for the last four years. Associated with the intermittent of food for the last two years with history of unintentional weight loss and uh, pain or long-standing uh, dyslexia or burning on the flex. Uh, he underwent an endoscopy one year gap and was advised surgery, sir. Shall I? So, Ivan, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, based on the history, uh, he's a 44 year old male with uh, dysphagia and uh, he's had an endoscopy, you said. And uh, is that the only investigation he had before he has been advised surgery or he has had other investigations also? Sir, uh, he was advised uh, further investigation and uh, surgery, sir. But uh, after endoscopy, he uh, didn't undergo uh, further evaluation or surgery. Or uh, any form of other treatment. Uh, in the... uh, so I think you have told us uh, that there is a dysphagia for the last two years. What is your what is your medical history? What do you think the cause of dysphagia before we go into the internet? Sir, excuse me, I'm having a background noise, sir. Yeah, I think there is a lot of echo on the background. Can you hear me or not? No, I can hear. You. Right. So, what I'm asking you is that with this history, what are the possibilities of a dysphagia you are considering? Uh, based from the history, the, he is having a long duration of history, sir. And uh, no, don't give me the reasons. Let's have your possibilities, and then we'll listen to your reasons for your possibilities. Uh, esophageal uh, motility disorder, sir. Probably uh, aplasia cardia, sir. And uh, second. Possibility is uh, any uh, uh, malignancy, sir, uh, which is uh, most likely in this patient. And is there a second possibility? I mean, your four year history, are you considering a malignancy? Uh, highly unlikely, sir. I'm not considering malignancy, sir. Any benign tumor of the esophagus, uh, like leomyoma, uh, have uh, this kind of presentation, sir. And so, leomyoma is a common uh, lesion that you have to consider it in the clinical differential. Yes, it is a common uh, uh, encounter a benign leomyoma in the esophagus. No, sir. Uh, it is a, uh, so, uh, considering uh, any other possibilities, uh, the more likely possibilities we should speak about first. 
Asia, you raised as one. We can come to that in a minute. But is there anything else you like? How about a benign peptic stricture? Peptic stricture, sir. Sorry, sir. There was a bit echo. Was there, sir? Why do you think this is not a peptic esophageal stricture due to acid peptic disease, reflux uh, disease? uh the point which goes against uh, the diagnosis of peptic esophageal stricture is the uh, no history of uh, dyspepsia or, or uh, peptic uh, symptoms sir, in this patient only dysphagia and uh, and uh, regurgitation sir. does that rule it out i mean is it, if you do not have you have some minor symptoms of heartburn and acidity it does not need to be florid uh, pronounced typical peptic ulcer symptoms and people can develop uh, strictures yes, okay. doesn't rule it out if the history were there it would help you but its absence doesn't rule out peptic stricture yes, what are the other features that uh, you are would say are against uh, peptic stricture uh, uh, regurgitation also can happen in peptic stricture sir and uh, mm, no history of heartburn retrosternal pain uh you follow the history of natural history of peptic stricture once a stricture develops the heartburn the regurgitation acidity dies down okay. because uh, the quantum of reflux is uh, dramatically decreased okay. so the absence once a stricture has developed the absence of uh, peptic uh, symptoms may not be very surprising yes, sir. on the other hand in achalasia can you get uh, peptic uh, symptoms of acidity heartburn Reg uh, regurgitation yes but acidity and heartburn are the symptoms that you commonly encounter in achalasia achalasia uh, the uh, regurgitation is a symptom sir but uh, heartburn is uh, less likely sir retrosternal chest pain can be there and uh, it is uncommon but if it is present what would be the reason say up to about 10 to 15% people can have heartburn and uh, um, uh, this acidity kind of symptoms So what is that due to? Because in achalasia there will be no reflux. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, still, uh, people do have symptoms of acidity in a small proportion. Uh, probably due to stasis of the food uh, and irritation of the esophageal mucosa, and that can uh, present stasis, fermentation, which can produce lactic acid and other yes, uh, organic acids, and can cause acidity symptoms. Yes, sir. Right. So, so basically. Here, the in the symptomatic analysis in dysphagia, you have to differentiate between motor dysphagia and uh, mechanical dysphagia. In mechanical, you have to distinguish between benign and malignant. Okay. So the features that suggest motor dysphagia here are long duration of history, long duration, sir, a long duration. Symptoms, suggestion of a markedly dilated esophagus because when you have florid regurgitation. Yes, uh, that means there is esophageal stasis, and uh, that uh, may um, suggest that is more likely to happen in a long-standing disease, uh, especially a motor dysphagia. Yes, and in the early part, the symptom that we did not hear you emphasize was uh, uh, dysphagia to hot or cold liquids, uh, yes, uneven dysphagia to liquid solids or liquids. Yes, sir. Uh, initially, he had dysphagia for solids, sir, and uh, intermittent. That was intermittent, and then for the pa for four years, and then for the past one year, he started having dysphagia for liquids, sir. And uh, there was no relationship uh, with the dysphagia with uh, ingestion of hot or cold uh, uh, food uh, in particular, sir. What is the typical history you get in achalasia? Is the liquid dysphagia more for liquids, more for solids, or similar for both? Achalasia, uh, his, in history, the dysphagia is slightly more for uh, solids, sir, and uh, then liquids, and then uh, regurgitation, sir. After that, uh, no, I don't think so. I think this is what you get in mechanical dysphagia. In mechanical dysphagia, there will be first dysphagia for high grade. When there is a low grade dysphagia, it is primarily for solids, then semi solids, and then liquids as the grade of dysphagia progresses. Whereas in motor dysphagia, you will have similar, or maybe at times in the initial parts, more difficulty in swallowing liquids, or a similar level of difficulty for swallowing both. So anyway, so uh, but these are just clinical pointers, and uh, obviously you will depend a lot on investigation.
Uh, so, Dr. Indian, sorry to interrupt you. You were talking about the investigations in this patient. So, you could please carry on with the investigations for this uh, individual. Yeah, no, I was just uh, uh, asking whether there were any other investigations done for this patient or only endoscopy was done. Um, you, I mean, you, he may not be able to tell you, but are you aware of any other? Uh, before coming here, sir, according to history, he uh, didn't uh, undergo any investigation, okay. sir. That's fine. And uh, uh, regarding chest pain, uh, it's an important symptom. And uh, what is uh, in relation to motor dysphagia? Uh, why is chest pain very important? Uh, in relation to motor dysphagia, sir, chest pain has uh, could be different reasons, sir. First, in achalasia, uh, it could be due to the uh, uh, irritation of the stasis, uh, static food material in the esophagus. And uh, other motor disorders, more particular, sir, uh, like uh, distal esophageal spasm and uh, uh, jackhammer esophagus and they have a predominant chest pain as a symptom sir even though in even the two in achalasia the type 2 and type 3 variants they can have a, a spastic uh, pan esophageal pressurization and uh, uh, premature contractions that can uh, lead to chest pain in such conditions and uh, next uh, uh, yeah so basically in uh, Classical achalasia, you don't have much of chest pain. Okay, so it indicates that you need to be careful in your diagnosis. And another important uh, feature of chest pain is that uh, when a patient has chest pain, the results of uh, whatever type of treatment that you do for the mobility problem uh, is not great. This, the pain may not be relieved. Okay, so one needs to be uh, aware of that situation. You just mentioned about the types of dysphagia. Can you tell us what are these types? One, two, three. Uh, yes, is, uh, you're talking about the Chicago classification. Uh, Chicago classification version four, sir. Achalasia is classified into three types, sir. Uh, type one is in type one achalasia. There is a failed peristalsis in the esophagus and uh, failed relaxation in the uh, lower esophageal sphincter, sir. And uh, in uh, lower esophageal sphincter integrated relaxation, pressure is more than uh, 15, sir. And uh, in type 2 uh, achalasia, there is a 100% uh, failed peristalsis, and uh, lower esophageal sphincter uh, fails to relax, and IRP is more than 15. And uh, there is a pan esophageal uh, pressurization in more than 20% of the swallows, sir. And in uh, type 3 achalasia, which is also called a spastic achalasia, and uh, the in this achalasia, there is a, a, fa a failed relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, which is going to, going to be there. Uh, IRP is more than 15. And uh, there is a premature contractions in the distal esophagus, sir, which uh, uh, with the distal latency of uh, less than 4.5 seconds, sir. I think also the esophageal peristaltic pressure can be fairly high. There is in a proportion of 10%, you may actually have preserved peristalsis. Uh, compared to uh, type 1, type 2, where it is zero, there is no propagated peristalsis. Yes, so, are you yeah. saying something? Else? Yeah, I was. Uh, I wanted to intervene that uh, you were telling about the dysphagia that is uh, to liquid and solid food. And Dr. Uh, Sarathat asked you, how did you differentiate whether it is not malignant versus echelasia? Do you yes, have sir. any other hint that one thing is that it is a long history that you said? Yes, sir. Certain features which will usually uh, hint you, sir has already told that it may be equal to solid and liquid foods in the echelasia, whereas in malignant esophageal structures, it will be gradually increasing first to solid and then to, to semi solid, then to liquid, and at the end up to saliva. Yes, that sir. is another hint. Now, yes, something important in the history of echelasia, which will give you a classical finding. You have heard that these patients will try to take a lot of fluid when they when they try to tend to swallow. Yes, sir. You heard that initially try to take yeah. which uh, yes. initially try to take uh, more amount of liquids. Uh, and, uh, initially it helped, but uh, gradually yeah. developed the symptoms for uh, liquids also, sir. And any other thing accessory, they will try to swab their neck. They will try to rotate their shoulders. 
trying to work it from the accessory muscles for to for it to follow equally. The classical finger is not present in the area. It is not present in any other patient, and they get lead by them, and it lasts for a longer duration. That is the classical history in Ecclesia. आने का बात कर रहे हैं ना Uh, can people switch off their microphone, please? There's a lot of interference going on. So I think Dr. Vikram, Dr. Indian, and our microphone should be open. Please close the other microphone. Yes. 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 Y
uh, the is affected was dilated and uh, roomy with uh, pulling of salivary content was present and uh, there was no esophagitis and uh, resistance felt felt in negotiating the scope through the lower esophageal sphincter with the giving away uh, of uh, pressure sir pop sign was present and uh, cardia fundus on retroflexion was normal and the stomach d1 d2 was normal sir right so what is pseudo achalasia dr deepan Sir, pseudo achalasia is a condition in which uh, the symptomatology uh, is uh, like that of the achalasia, but he has a mechanical uh, problem uh, to begin with, sir. And the most probably is uh, carcinoma G junction and uh, carcinoma fundus of the stomach involving uh, the uh, G junction, or uh, in rare instances, malignancy of the lung pleura, and can infiltrate the esophagus and uh, produce such symptoms, sir. you can have uh, clinical symptoms as well as manometric findings which are similar to achalasia yes, uh, but uh, on endoscopy generally on retroversion you will find a tumor in the region of the cardia which may be intrinsic or very rarely extrinsic but generally uh, arising from the cardia ge junction uh, yes. right so endoscopy here is suggestive or diagnostic and after this endoscopy you feel the need to do anything else or you think it is sufficient to diagnose achalasia and proceed with the management uh, endoscopy is uh, uh, not a diagnostic modality sir uh, to diagnose achalasia uh, the gold standard modality is uh, if available uh, high resolution manometry sir if not many centers don't have hrm yes sir in in centers in which they don't have hrm and uh, uh, they have to go for a, a barium swallow or a tine barium examination sir Bar- Barium swallow is a screening modality, and time barium examination is a more definite. I thought you showed us a chest X-ray film. Can you go back to the chest X-ray? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. So, what are the features on an X-ray chest which might suggest to you the diagnosis of achalasia? Sir, in mm-hmm. chest X-ray, there could be a mediastinal widening, or with uh, air fluid level can be there, sir. In uh, achalasia, it can be there, but uh, I okay, couldn't see this, this patient. And uh, if the patient is having a really long-standing achalasia and having a sigmoid uh, esophagus, that could be uh, uh, visualized in a uh, chest X-ray, sir. You said an air fluid level. Where would you expect an air fluid level? Sir, in the mediastinum, sir, possibly. Uh, lower right uh, medial sternal medial widening and often a parasternal uh, on the right side a parasternal shadow yes. of a dilated esophagus when you have a truly dilated sigmoid esophagus yes. and also in an upright position often the fundal air bubble will be absent you will not see a fundal air bubble because of the very tight um, yeah, sphincter uh, problem okay. and in a dilated esophagus you can have an air fluid level in the mediastinum plus any aspiration pneumonitis or really a bronchiectasis uh, features in the lungs so it's always worthwhile looking yes. at an x-ray chest in a patient with long standing disease to look for these uh, yes. um, features okay so you mentioned a barium do you have a barium for this patient yes sir uh, sir this is a, a barium examination sir uh, uh, in which uh, the uh, there is a column of the uh, barium sir uh, and uh, there is a fluid level in the chest sir and uh, and uh, lung fields are uh, relatively uh, normal looking sir and uh, the diameter esophagus is dilated to 5.9 uh, 5.9 cm sir and the length of the column is 25 27 cm sir in this barium examination no, no i mean i think what what is the typical thing you are looking for this is just a dilated esophagus A peptic stricture can give you such a dilated esophagus. What is there to suggest anything at this period? Dilatation is uh, going up till the gastroesophageal junction, sir, and that, that doesn't that make it like it. Yeah, any long-standing benign stricture can give you a dilatation all the way up to the pharyngeal pharynx. What is the typical appearance on barium which uh, makes you in the gastroesophageal junction? G junction, there is narrowing of the G junction is there, sir. Which was can be the G junction. Can you point out any with your uh, pan pointer on the screen? You have heard of the bird beak appearance? Sir, here, sir. Typical bird beak appearance is what is described uh, in achalasia. Where are we seeing the bird beak? 
you have other friends also which you had shown in between the yeah. others yeah <laughs> so i think the third one probably to be closer there are actually unless you can enlarge it and see can uh, make out the bird beak appearance there this this yes so the, those that is um, uh, something that has been commonly seen in the barium now tell us about a time barium isotopogram what is it and what is it why should it be done sir uh, time barium in time barium isophagogram sir uh, the patient is uh, given 100 ml of uh, thin barium to swallow and uh, films are taken at the in a, a plain film and 1 uh, minute 1 uh, uh, minute 5 minutes and 10 uh, minutes sir 1 well, minute 2 minute and 5 minutes sir sorry and uh, in this okay. uh, direct film direct film is taken at baseline at uh, at 1 minute 2 minutes and 5 minutes 5 minutes yes. and uh, in a patient with a normal uh, esophageal peristalsis and rejunction relaxation the uh, the all the barium should cleared into the all the barium barium should pass into the stomach within 1 minute sir and uh, if the presence of the barium in a 2 minute film and 5 minute film is uh, suggestive of uh, 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 there is a uh, esophageal uh, lower yeah. esophageal junction uh, obstruction, sir. And uh, does the amplitude of the barium column help, sir? Uh, the length and the width of the barium column uh, is uh, can help, sir. The area of the barium column. Uh, the height of the barium column is important. The width will depend on the esophagus how dilated it is. Yes, the sir. column will be wide. The height will. Because it is the sphincter is opening by gravity, and it is the height of the barium column. Uh, the higher the column, the greater would likely be the LES pressure, and the slower the relaxation. Yes. And I think this is something the time barium esophagogram column can be followed following uh, interventions, particularly when you do a pneumatic dilatation or uh, other kinds of uh, non-surgical interventions, which are commonly done for, for ecclesia. monitor the patient i think it does help to look at the height of the barium column during follow up as well as of course the first thing is the time barium esophagogram that is if barium height of the barium column at 2 minutes and 5 minutes comes down or the 5 minute completely resolves then you have an adequate dilatation uh, done uh, right so for serial follow up uh, with uh, when without the help of manometry uh, time barium esophagogram may be uh, useful so now more finally uh, manometry is essential in patients who may have an atypical appearance there is chest pain there is a, a narrow esophagus um, and uh, the, the typical the uh, there is only a borderline uh, delayed abnormal time barium esophagogram then you are uncertain whether you te- are dealing typically with achalasia or some other mixed uh, motility disorders then you would definitely want uh, Uh, esophageal manometry or a high resolution manometry to be done uh, if you have a typical bird beak appearance and a barium esophagogram like you are seeing here and an endoscopic appearance that is consistent cross sectional imaging showing that there is no tumor anywhere or any other extrinsic compression on the lower esophagus then it may not be necessary to have an hrm in every patient so what are the hrm features i thought you were showing us the hrm tracing in this person HRM tracing uh, HRM is a high resolution manometry sir it consists of a probe and the sensors are placed 1 uh, cm uh, at 1 cm distance uh, in the probe and uh, there are total 36 sensors are placed and uh, the probe is uh, placed into the stomach uh, and the patient is uh, has to swallow uh, liquids and solids in erect and supine position sir and uh, the pressure changes in the esophagus uh, during uh, the procedure is monitored sir So these man, these sensors allow you to trace uh, propagated peristalsis. Yes, sir. 5 mL or 10 mL swallows are normally given, and with that uh, you look for propagated peristalsis. And you already told us the different manometric patterns according to the Chicago classification for type 1, 2, and 3. So are you able to interpret or to read the give us the um, uh, read out the report of the HRM in this patient? sir in in this case sir uh, there is a uh, median irp is 25.8 uh, sir it is uh, 
uh, increased and uh, incomplete and uh, there is a uh, press registration there is a pan is official uh, press registration in 50% of swallows sir and they have mentioned that 100% uh, of the peristalsis are normal in this case but uh, uh, but keeping all other the factors into consideration this uh, goes more in favor of uh, aclesia cardia sir and there is no uh, premature contraction sir and uh, so uh, futures are likely to be uh, aclesia cardia propagated peristalsis if it is present and if it is repeatedly found i would either ask for repeat manometric examination because propagated peristalsis cannot be present in more than 10% of swallows in aclesia if there is a, if somebody has reported propagated peristalsis and this is preserved peristalsis uh, then i think the diagnosis of aclesia may have to be reviewed yes sir you have a irp is the integrated relaxation pressure which is a uh, indicator of the lower esophageal pressure Yes, lower esophageal uh, relaxation sir dci has also mentioned the distal contact contractile integral uh dca is not mentioned in this uh, report sir uh, right so that would be fairly low in a typical uh, type 1 type 2 achalasia but would be high in uh, type 3 or uh, vigorous achalasia or spastic achalasia as it is called so the pressure there that would be uh, present and i think uh, uh, the i'm not able to make out uh, from this uh, tracing but the person performing the manometry will be looking for propagated peristalsis yes, if propagated peristalsis is present then the diagnosis of achalasia will have to be reviewed yes, you have a distal esophageal spasm des or uh, other um, uh, hypertensive lower esophageal sphincter not tractor esophageal these all have, uh, have uh, les as well as body motility abnormalities yes, but preserved peristalsis if it is uh, consistently shown will uh, have you will uh, need to review the diagnosis or repeat the procedure to confirm is it truly present or not the barium you have shown the endoscopy findings you have shown history etc everything is fits in nicely with achalasia yes, in fact i think uh, uh, i would probably have been uh, comfortable managing this patient without even getting an hrm done yes, and uh, proceed with the further management Okay. okay. So, uh, the two major requirements is one is uh, increased increased tone at the lower end of esophagus, and second thing is absence of peristalsis. Absolutely. This is the basic requirement to label it as achalasia. Absolutely. And for type one, it has to be approximately ten percent peristalsis present. But if it is, it has to be more absent peristalsis that is mandatory. Yes, sir. So I think the manometry finding is either wrong. Manometry has wrongly been done. Or it is not in support with your diagnosis. Diagnosis. Yeah, I think Doctor Inen was saying something. Deepan, uh, if uh, I may ask you, so basically you have shown us the uh, manometry. Now, if you have a manometry available in your center, is it uh, mandatory to do a barium also? Like, uh, suppose you do have a manometry, uh, is barium part of the uh, diagnosis? Diagnostic pathway always, sir. If uh, manometry is uh, suggestive of achalasia without any clinical doubt, and uh, there is no uh, apogee is uh, suggestive of achalasia, and uh, barium can be omitted, sir. Actually, it's the other way around. I think it's always good to have a barium study because it sort of gives you a roadmap of what uh, you see. A lot of things, uh, uh, information that you get. Uh, and also, it uh, is an object. A time barium is an objective evaluation, not only of the diagnosis but also of your results. So I think it's good to do a barium study, a time barium study, even if you have a manometry. The other side of the question is, uh, if you don't have manometry available, uh, is it okay to go ahead and operate uh, just based on the barium study? Because uh, not barium. I mean, manometry is not available in in many centers. So the answer to that, I I think, is uh, one needs to be very careful because uh, you know the classic achalasia is just one part of the broad spectrum. So one needs to be very careful before operating uh, without a manometry. Uh, however, as Sir was alluding to, I mean, if it's a classical history with a classical barium, uh, I think. It is enough to diagnose uh, uh, achalasia, but 
one needs to be very careful. Uh, a very good history is absolutely essential. Uh, if you are going to operate uh, on somebody uh, without a high resolution manometer. And mind you, having a high resolution manometry is one thing and uh, performing it properly and reading and uh, you know, interpreting it properly is another thing. So I think uh, it's important not only not to have the test available, but also know how to, like what you were discussing, how to read the uh, results and uh, interpret it and then go on with the uh, treatment. I'm, I was going to also ask you, uh, you know, regarding the type 1, 2, 3 you are alluding to, does it have a bearing on the uh, type of operation you will do? Let's say if you're going to operate on this patient, uh, does it have a bearing on the type of operation? And uh, does it have, have a bearing on the ultimate outcome or results? Sir, type, uh, one, two, three. Yes, uh, type 1, 2, 3, uh, among the type 1, 2, 3, type 2 is having the best prognosis, sir. And uh, while choosing the choice of uh, inter uh, myotomy uh, in, in surgical myotomy, uh, I would like to choose uh, uh, laparoscopic hellas myotomy in uh, type 1 and 2 uh, aclasia cardia. And uh, in type 3 uh, aclasia cardia, I would like to choose uh, a peroral endoscopic myotomy. Because in uh, type 3 aclasia, there is a hyperperistaltic segment of the esophagus and there is a longer length of myotomy is needed in those patients. So, between poem and Heller's myotomy is what you're saying. Uh, but if you're doing the Heller's myotomy, uh, would you alter the operation based on this? Three? Let's say for one and two and three. Uh, would you do the same uh, operation or would you? Are you likely to alter the actual operation also? Uh, in uh, in type three, I would. Poem is not available. Uh, well, I'm alluding to a situation. Poem is not available in your center. Uh, you can only only do dilatation, or you could perhaps do a lap Keller's biotomy. Okay. Sir. So you've got uh, type one, two, three. Yes, now you're the surgeon. You've decided to operate on a patient. Okay. How would you alter, or would you alter your Heller's myotomy based on type 1, 2, 3. Sir, uh, in type 3, I would like to give a longer myotomy, sir, into the esophagus. And uh, in in rest of the cases, uh, I uh, type 1 and 2 uh, standard, sir, 5 centimeters. Okay. Uh, in, in part of the lap, uh, Heller's myotomy is a wrap or a fundoplication. Uh, would you alter or would you selectively do the fundoplication or would you do it for all patients or would you alter it based on the type of achalasia based on HR? In type 3 achalasia, sir, uh, um, I'm not sure, sir. So basically, I think the answer to that question is that uh, reflux is a significant problem. Uh, so I guess you have to do some sort of an anti-reflux procedure for all these uh, patients, regardless of type 1, 2, 3, if you're doing a lap tell us not. So in other words, the current recommendation is not to omit the uh, fund of uh, okay. based on the uh, HR results. Uh, because if you have a type 3, sometimes you think, should I just omit the uh, not doing the wrap? But I think it's not good practice to do it because of the uh, associated reflux. So yes, I agree with you. You need to do a longer myotomy for a type three, but you would do a fund of like a partial wrap, uh, usually an anterior wrap for uh, all the three if you are doing a. Uh, so, Doctor Devan, how long is the myotomy that you can do from a? Uh uh, an abdominal approach, a laparoscopic approach. The abdominal esophageal myotomy can be done, but yes. how about the, how long can you make it? You said five centimeters, but yes. if you have to make say a long myotomy, as you said in type three, how long would it be? Sir, uh, uh, in type three, uh, I would like to give eight to 10 centimeter myotomy, sir. and. Uh, do you have any idea about any comparisons between POEM and um, uh, uh, lap uh, myotomy for uh, type 3? I mean, how long do you think is the myotomy that's done in uh, POEM? 
poem uh, myotomy uh, it is done around 10 cm myotomy poem in usually the myotomy is uh, uh, done up until the area of the high pressure segment of the esophagus sir if hrm is available otherwise uh, 8 to 10 cm uh, is done in poem poem whenever you start you start in the mid esophagus and you go down through the le sphincter into the lower portion so the entire abdominal esophageal myotomy as well as almost about 12 to 15 cm from the mid thoracic you can divide and especially in people having chest pain or type 3 myotomy dysphagia along with chest pain uh, the long myotomy is possible with poem right so the length would probably be more but how much better is it in terms of outcomes in uh, terms of relief in uh, dysphagia is excellent but also relief in chest pain i think those data need to be seen i'm not aware of any head to head comparison between the and modalities but uh, in poem is probably you are in a position to make a longer myotomy than with the uh, hellers i mean the opinion would want to comment on that yes sir i think uh, the standard myotomy would be like the uh, 6 cm into the esophagus and uh, maybe uh, 2 to 3 cm on to the stomach this is for a lap hellers myotomy but of course for a poem uh, it's about uh, you know, 20 to 15 cm into the esophagus depending on where you start so uh, yeah. that is the thing the only thing is with poem the stomach side uh, can sometimes be an issue sometimes they you know uh, if you stay yeah, under done yeah it's under done so always the esophageal part is not a problem it's usually the uh, stomach part which is under done uh, and the converse is true if you are going to do a lap hellas myotomy through the abdomen of course uh, you can do do it thoracoscopically uh, where you can do a much longer myotomy but the yes. problem with thoracoscopic myotomy is again the fact that you cannot go much into the soft sorry into the on the stomach side so uh, that would be a issue with the uh, you can't do two operations you can't do it on the stomach and abdomen so Uh, between the thoracic and the uh, thoracoscopic and laparoscopic myotomy uh, the laparoscopic one is the uh, standard uh, and the preferred technique now because previously it was done uh, originally it was done thoracoscopic now as we all know it's standard practice to do it uh, laparoscopic i have only two concerns in this entire discussion one thing important is Uh, that in a poem we don't have any part of pulduplication being done. Yes, sir. That is a drawback with the poem, and uh, the reflex symptoms are uh, higher with the poem patient, sir. And uh, how much? Which is for a type one, it is still the standard of care is a Hellers myotomy as compared to a poem. But we, when you have a more spastic esophagus, you can still go ahead with a poem because then type two and type three, it is poor poem which is more recommended. the two reasons for it is you are not having a pulduplication and second thing is you can have a longer myotomy as has been said which is required specifically for type 3 uh, uh, ecclesia is the rarest and second thing is uh, what as uh, dr ivin has said that we often do a, a trans thoracic myotomy for some of the patients when they have a long segment uh, uh, esophageal involvement and we feel that the peristalsis it will be difficult in this group of patient you may add a abdominal approach also because the thoracic approach is done by a prone position and then ultimately we put the position and do a abdominal approach also but that is usually not a standard of care uh, because the, the the line of dissection in the two is separate different so it is not possible normally so but in all uh, laparoscopic approaches pulduplication is a part to it now gradually from listen people are going towards a door But still, Nixon versus Dorr is still a controversy. Uh, it's perhaps better to do some sort of a partial pulduplication, either a, a Dorr or a Tupe, rather than a, a, a Nixon, uh, is what the current recommendations say, uh, to avoid uh, further dysphagia. So that is personal preference, but uh, some form of pulduplication has to be added on uh, to your lab as well. And there is a question in the chat box about uh, why is anterior pulduplication preferred. Would you like to answer that, uh, Dr. Deepan? Anterior pulduplication. There is a mucosa was opened anteriorly, sir, and it helps in buttressing the mucosa and uh, uh, 
to prevent uh, any addition formation with the mucosa or any leak uh, uh, possibly sir yeah i think in addition to what you've said anterior fundoplication it does it does buttress the uh, or cover the myotomy side particularly on the stomach side yes, right? because uh, on the esophageal side the plane is quite easy to get okay uh, if, if you're going to perforate it's much more commoner on the lower side on the stomach side because the uh, submucosal plane is not very great on the stomach side so that is absolutely true so that is one point um but basically if you do uh, if you look at the grade of uh, reflux prevention between let's say a dors fundoplication to a tupe to a nissen that would be the the order of uh, you know how much you would be able to prevent in other words a nissen would be a much more better anti reflux procedure compared to a tupe compared to a dors so that will be the sequence so in a patient who has already got dysphagia you want you don't want to do a uh, fundoplication that is you know that, that is going to be tight okay so you want to prevent reflux but at the same time you want don't want to give a dysphagia so therefore uh, the least would be uh, a door uh, fundoplication where the which has least amount of dysphagia so i think in my mind that also plays a a, a role in deciding why you want to do a door compared to a you know a complete Uh, I think we are almost uh, running short of time. Uh, right. Can I ask you one question? Uh, suppose you have a patient with a sigmoid esophagus, okay, yes, uh, like an end stage achalasia. Now, yes, how would you approach this patient? Would you straight away go into an esophagectomy, or would you do dilatation, then go on to uh, Heller's myotomy, and then? is project me what is your approach to it sir if the if a patient is having a sigmoid esophagus sir and uh, the patient is uh, operative candidate for surgery uh, in the sense he is not having any poor chest condition and no comorbidities and uh, he is a fit uh, a good better functional status for surgery i would like to give a trial of uh, 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 myotomy helis myotomy once and uh, see whether if the symptom improves and if not only i would go for a esophagectomy sir esophagectomy is a highly uh, morbid procedure uh, and uh, relatively simpler procedure is there and we can give a trial of a uh, uh, mean uh, sigmoid esophagus case before uh, attempting esophagectomy sir in my opinion yeah i think uh, that is true i think sir would also perhaps agree Uh, it, are there any study i mean uh, comparisons or uh, follow ups long term follow ups following myotomy for a sigmoid esophagus what is the outcome of myotomy is usually for a sigmoid esophagus deepan you want to answer that question yes deepan i'm not sure i'm not sure sir you have suggested a course of action so is there any evidence or any um, any reports to support your uh, uh, view I mean, one would expect that there will be poor gas esophageal emptying in a recumbent in a so a sigmoid esophagus even after a myotomy. So, any follow-up information or uh, in data available? Well, I mean, the, as to my knowledge, they are very scanty. Other than case reports, there may not be too many. But the result is suboptimal in the sense that. stasis symptoms will per, may persist and uh, um, uh, dysphagia is only partially relieved uh, following um, myotomy for a sigmoid esophagus but uh, generally the, uh, whether it is an acceptable outcome in a difficult situation would probably very very much depend on the individual uh, um, patient so for indian what has your experience yeah i agree <laughs> basically the If you look at the current uh, achalasia guidelines, uh, current recommendation says to perform less invasive procedures such as dilatation, even uh, and uh, lap fillers may not be, uh, and or OM for uh, uh, end stage achalasia first before going to esophagus. So certainly it would be worthwhile uh, trying it. I feel it it buys some time uh, more than anything else. Uh, it you have to inform the patient that this is not going to be the uh, you know the results are going to be poor uh, 
and then keep the isovagectomy as the uh, you know last option uh, in terms of failure. So don't don't go ahead and do an isovagectomy uh, upfront. The threshold has to be high for is isovagectomy. Right. I mean, actually, I personally am not aware of any cases or any patients in whom after a lap hellers and people maybe have gone on to do isophagectomies. So how commonly does that happen in your experience? Uh, um, basically, uh, we actually have one patient uh, currently uh, we are planning, sir. So it's uh, not certain, not common because many, many patients are able to go on uh, and adjust with, uh, with such a management. But uh, we, we have done uh, in the last maybe two or three years, uh, maybe one patient. Uh, so uh, we've done a total of maybe two or three uh, so far post uh, lap hellas myotomy. Uh, is a right. Uh, we also agree that uh, uh, there are only a few number of patients which will require, but they are classically only the sigmoid esophagus that, was, that may require subsequently uh, uh, esophagectomy. Otherwise, uh, remaining all they do reasonably well following a uh, Hellas yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and if okay. I may, one last question, uh, Deepan. Suppose you've done a lap Hellas myotomy and the patient comes back with uh, uh, with recurrence of symptoms. Yes, sir. Post lap Hellas myotomy. Yes, sir. Uh, dysphagia. Recurrent dysphagia. Recurrent dysphagia post lap fillers. Maybe two, three years down the line, patient comes back to you. We have to uh, once again evaluate uh, to look for any other, uh, all other causes are ruled out and it is still uh, same the disease recurrence. Then we would like to intervene again, sir, in another modality of uh, choice, sir. If poem is possible or poem or a pneumatic dilatation. Uh, is if pneumatic dilatation is possible, pneumatic dilatation, so not with the same uh, treatment we had done earlier. Uh, I would like to do uh, the other uh, investigation uh, in POEM versus uh, pneumatic dilatation depending upon the patient's physical condition. I would like to choose, sir. Yeah, I think uh, when you are uh, dealing with such a situation, I think it's very important to go back, uh, make sure your original diagnosis was correct. Okay? somebody else may have operated or it may have been done in another center if it was not done by you it's very important to get as much as information as possible make sure the diagnosis is right because you can't uh, do another wrong operation so i think that is very very crucial suppose if you know everything about the patient or you have, have operated on this patient then you need to revisit the whole thing you need to repeat all the investigations including manometric and as you rightly said uh, you can start with dilatation. I think dilatation is perhaps the least you can do. Uh, and then, as you said, uh, if poem is available, it may be a, uh, an option because the myotomy is done in a in another uh, uh, face or angle. So that is perhaps better than doing a repeat lap. We had two patients. In which we had a Hellers myotomy being done and then subsequently we had to revise the surgery. One was my own patient and one was the patient operated elsewhere. So uh, for my patient, I knew that I do only an anterior midline Hellers myotomy, classical that we do in laparoscopically. And uh, so uh, then I when I revisited, when I, then this time I did not do it laparoscopically, I had made it open. And I had done a myotomy onto the greater curvature of the towards the greater curvature of the stomach onto the left side. So and then made a revision uh, of that myotomy and then did a fundoplication again. In the other patient which was operated elsewhere, I did not know what the cause was, but I had an extensive fibrosis at the G junction and at the at the fundoplication side. So we had to uh, remove the fundoplication and it was a door fundoplication done earlier. Mine was an essence, but what was referred to me was a door done outside. I had to reopen it and then subsequently I had to open the entire, if the same site where possibly the, uh, the, the myotomy was done, the mucosa got opened and then I had to make a wrap with the stomach. And fortunately both the patients are working and we did not have much of nissens at that point in time, but recently we did not have any patient who had come with the hellers being done outside. In one of these patients, we planned even for a resection if it was required. Sure, I mean they are 
difficult uh, problems and one has yes i agree with that careful with that. okay fine i think we are running out of time thanks thanks everybody uh, thanks to sasha of indian and a good presentation thanks thanks thank you thank you okay